It's Dr. Sabrina Siegel here with a special series brought to you by the NEI Podcast. Welcome to the Psychopharmastology Show. In this special series, Dr. Andrew Cutler interviews Dr. Stephen Stahl on the most controversial, novel, and exciting topics in psychopharmacology today. Every three months, we will address a different theme in psychopharmacology. Each theme is split into three parts with one part released each month. The next theme is on Alzheimer's disease the amyloid hypothesis, disease modification, and breakthroughs in diagnosis and treatment. Today, Dr. Andy Cutler interviews Dr. Lon Schneider on biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and treatments that target amyloid. Let's listen in to part two of our theme, Alzheimer's disease, biomarkers, and treatments that target amyloid. Hello and welcome to another episode of the NEI Psychopharmacology Show, the uh, podcast series with Dr. Stephen Stahl. Steve, how you doing? Great. I'm looking forward to this and it should be very interesting. Some controversies in the field, always interesting when that happens. I totally agree. Well, we yeah. are here in a second part of a series that we're doing on Alzheimer's disease. And with us today is an old friend of mine, something we share in common. We're both originally from Philadelphia, but have moved to warmer climates. Dr. Lon Schneider from University of Southern California. Lon, how are you doing? I'm um, doing pretty well. How are you doing, Andy? Doing great, thanks. We're really excited to dive into this. But Lon, first, you've been at this quite a while, and I want to get your take on kind of where we have been and where we're going. You know, we have spent a lot of money and a lot of time, a lot of studies have been done, and it seems like we've had some limited success, but perhaps the future is a little brighter. What can, what's kind of your take on this? Well, that's a broad question. The pharmacology and therapeutics of, of dementia in general and Alzheimer's disease has been evolving about as slowly as the illness evolves over the last 30 years. So we make these small advances, and as in all pharmacology, we tend to learn more about the drugs themselves and understand more about the biological effects of them than we do about the clinical effects. So we make progress, and to that extent, optimistic. I can't possibly, though, vibe or predict the future. Yeah, of course. Do you feel like we've made advances in the understanding of the neuropathology of the illness that can potentially translate into some treatments? Well, first, we've made substantial advances in, in understanding the pathology and understanding the complexity of the, of the pathology. That, as you know, doesn't automatically convert to to understanding of the treatment. So a main focus and a main aspect of our understanding of Alzheimer's disease specifically concerns the role of amyloid and especially of amyloid precursor protein in the early development of the pathology. And it's because of that and because of the focus on, on amyloid, the mismetabolism of that amyloid, the creation of, of various different species of, of amyloid that, that we've in turn directed therapeutic efforts towards, towards that. Yeah. To that extent, we've made considerable uh, progress and we've understood to a large degree why this is an early biological effect in the illness. Well, that's certainly true. Do you feel like the amyloid theory has produce the kind of results, though, that we would hope for? Do you feel like this is where we need to keep focusing? So asking for a straight out opinion, no, it's been disappointing. Oh. The early idea is, oh, it's an amyloidosis, excess amyloidosis. We can define an amyloid, an amyloid cascade and then figure that there are any number of places we can intervene in, for example, binding amyloid fibrils or oligomers and with an antibody and allowing that to be opsonized by microglia and that that should work. Clearing plaques should work. I think what we find over time is that we can develop antibodies and small molecules that can, in fact, clear plaque and 
fibrils, but but the translation of that into a clinical improvement is very slight indeed. It's so slight that we have difficulty agreeing that there is an effect at all. So so that's clearly a limited path to to go down and brings up again the idea that we have more to learn. Yeah, well said. I mean, it makes sense, and I get it, and we've spent a lot of time, as I mentioned, a lot of money developing these anti-amyloid therapies. And you're right that amyloid is not one heterogeneous thing. It's obviously more sophisticated and complicated, and there have been various things targeting various, as you mentioned, oligomers and enzymes, but it has been disappointing. We've gotten pretty good at sucking amyloid out of the brain, it seems like, but there's a lot more going on here. Obviously, perhaps this is something that's happening way down the road. Maybe if we can intervene earlier. Well, that's how we tend to feel. If you take the history of the use and development of monoclonal antibodies against amyloid, we started off with with an antibody, bapinuzumab, that was derived from a mouse model of amyloidosis. And we started off in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. This was not particularly effective, bapinuzumab. And in fact, the studies were stopped midway. And we evolved to thinking, oh, well, maybe mild to moderate is too far along. Maybe there is too (laughs) much neurodegeneration, too much amyloid. So let's then try to treat earlier. Let's try to treat mild Alzheimer's disease as we did with solanezumab. And then continuing on, well, let's also try to make sure that people have an amyloidosis. So treat people with mild Alzheimer's disease who have a positive amyloid biomarker. There were limited results with the antibodies at that time. And our reaction to that is, well, perhaps we're still not early enough. So let's perhaps move to just MCI due to Alzheimer's disease, prodromal Alzheimer's (laughs) disease, again Mm -hmm. with an amyloid biomarker. Maybe if we move earlier, we will see an effect. Now, if we move earlier, then the rate of worsening or the clinical course of very early Alzheimer's disease is even slower than a moderate Alzheimer's disease. So now we need to make sure that our trials go out long enough, go out a year and a half or so. And we're working off of inference. Well, it's it's not working in mild to moderate. Maybe it'll work in mild. Maybe it'll work in MCI and prodromal AD, especially when we have an amyloid biomarker. And Mm -hmm. we're now also at the point where we are using antibodies in what we call preclinical Alzheimer's disease. This is almost a prevention study. We define preclinical as a person without memory, an older person without memory impairment, maybe a memory complaint who has a positive biomarker for amyloid. And so there's several studies, four studies that that go out, randomized controlled trials that go out for years in an attempt to use antibodies to, to essentially prevent the onset of mild cognitive impairment. So that's been the trend. And I think, unfortunately, the effects we see are rather small. And so it's then hard to assess whether we are making progress or not. That's, I think, where we are. Can I ask, Lon, why do you think the effects are small? Do you think that we're targeting the wrong thing or that it just is a slowly evolving thing so the effect sizes are small and it's more of a methodology and clinical trials design thing? Well, it could be both. But I tend to lean towards we're targeting an ineffective target or a target that, if it's a valid target, needs some supplementation by targeting something else. It's just hard to explain how the antibodies, the drugs, do exactly what they were designed to do. In the case of Canamab, which is now recently approved, and of Aducanumab, which is also approved, accelerated approval, they bust plaque. They reduce plaques down to normal. Yet there is very little to show clinically. I think that if we had the right target, we would be seeing a greater clinical effect. Now, the counter to that still comes back to, it's kind of circular, 
Well, we still don't know enough. And the studies on which these drugs have been approved with accelerated approval only went on for a year and a half. And perhaps what needs to happen is that we need greater exposure than a year and a half, perhaps longer, perhaps three years, perhaps four years. And alternatively, perhaps the clinical effect is substantially delayed. And it's a disease-modifying effect such that the treatment now, the treatment that participants received for a year and a half, will grow bigger over time as we compare their course of illness to the course of illness of people who had been treated with placebo, that the groups will separate even more. Now, we take our clinical trials that go on for a year and a half, and we project a a trajectory of deterioration outward, and we use that as the justification. Looks like the curves are separating And let's see if in another uh, year or two, they don't continue to separate. That's more of a wish and a hypothesis than it is a demonstration of disease modification. So what we have is we have a couple of medications, a couple of antibody treatments that may in the future show an effect over a longer period of time. But we don't have that information now. I want to ask a lot another thing, which is that I very much agree with what you just said myself, but I get pushback from Alzheimer's experts that that are still quite optimistic about the amyloid cascade hypothesis. Has that begun to fray and are you the mainstream now or are you an outlier? So there's the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which is really the amyloid cascade theory. And then there is the idea that if you interfere with the amyloid cascade with certain drugs, that in and of itself is therapeutic. And the two ideas are really pretty independent. So look, there's no question in my mind that the misprocessing of amyloid precursor protein is a seminal event in what ultimately becomes neurodegeneration accompanied by, um, by an amyloidosis or Alzheimer's disease. That's really clear. But the other part of that is the theory that if you interfere in the amyloid cascade and if you stop the production or decrease the amount of amyloid plaques, insoluble amyloid fibrils, soluble protofibrils, or any of the dozens and dozens of oligomers of two to 200 amyloid peptides bound together, that if you reduce those oligomers, or for that matter, if you reduce the A-beta-42 monomer, that you'll necessarily get a therapeutic response. And I think that's where I might separate myself from colleagues who believe that if we just keep working on decreasing the amount of amyloid or just keep working on finding the oligomers that might be responsible, that may be directly responsible for neurodegeneration and reduce that concentration that we would clearly have a therapeutic effect. There's more to it than that. And the direct linkage of the amyloidosis directly to neurodegeneration still hasn't been made. So it's more complicated. So I tend to be a bit more either skeptical or empirical. What we've accomplished so far is rather limited in the therapeutic area. I mean, there are advances we could make, but they may take a frustratingly long time, such as amyloidosis and the misprocessing of the proteinopathy is occurring in middle age. Perhaps really the intervention in the amyloid cascade is preventative and needs to occur in middle age, if not earlier. Perhaps then a treatment with monoclonal antibodies or with vaccines to induce A beta antibodies could be effective. But that will take a frustratingly long time. Well, Lon, you've stimulated lots of questions in my mind. And one of them is, I guess it depends to some degree on how we define success. Are we defining success as preventing further deterioration? Are we defining success as reversing the process somehow? Are we defining success as early intervention, which of course would require better biomarkers, although we have some. And then you brought up something else that I would be interested in your thoughts on, which is the idea of combination therapy. I mean, perhaps this is part of the treatment and perhaps 
other interventions coupled with interfering here with amyloid would be even more therapeutic. Well, quite possibly the latter, that combinations of treatment could be therapeutic. Back to your question of how do you define success? You know, as a simple clinical trialist, he defines success as an advantageous <laughs> difference between the people treated with the treatment, with the medication, and the people treated with placebo. And in fact, <laughs> that's how we do the statistics. One group different from the others. But the subtlety here is what the trajectory of deterioration is and whether the difference between the treated group and the placebo group makes a difference. So in considering disease modification, we don't necessarily think that we have to see improvement in cognitive and functional symptoms. We might be satisfied with stabilization. We might be satisfied with less deterioration than the placebo group. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. what we see so far is that both treatment groups and placebo groups deteriorate, and they deteriorate mm -hmm. to a good degree. Then we're just looking at the difference and the magnitude of the difference between these two groups that are deteriorating. What makes this also very hard to assess is that we haven't designed our studies as clear survival studies. So we're looking at group differences without being able to identify who within the treatment groups might actually be responding to a greater degree. And then with respect to disease modification, by following people only for 1.5 years for the most part, or for two years with gantinuramab, we don't know whether this difference between treatment and regular clinical course will grow larger or not. And so these are the uncertainties, and this is the uncertainty we now face in treating patients. Will there be people who wish to be treated with antibodies, and we mm -hmm. would be recommending it. It's a long-term commitment, a year and a half, taking infusions every two weeks. But when will there be enough treatment? How long do we continue treatment? A year and a half beyond? How do we define success in a group? that we know will worsen as a group over time anyway with treatment? How do we know whether a particular individual is in fact benefiting with the medication? So it leaves us in a particular therapeutic uncertainty here. It really would have been nice if we had big effects. Yeah. Well, especially, you know, your tracing of the evolution of the clinical trials is really instructive here because... What you're saying is as we start using these treatments earlier and earlier in the clinical process, now you are extending out the duration that you have to follow to see the benefit. As you've said, this illness is going to progress pretty slowly here. So you're absolutely right. A year and a half in that context doesn't seem anywhere near long enough to show benefit. Yep. So these are the uh, challenges. I think something very important will occur in the next few months, and that is one of the trials in preclinical Alzheimer's disease, again, these are people without cognitive impairment. They may have cognitive complaints. They may be scoring a little bit low, but still well within normal for, for cognitive function. But they do have a positive amyloid PET scan. And we, in research criteria, we call this preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And there have been studies where, where people are randomized to an antibody or to placebo and followed for three, four, five, six years. So mm -hmm. an important, a potentially important study called the A4 study, which randomized preclinical participants to solanezumab or to placebo and have been following them now for a minimum of four years and some towards seven years, will read out in March. And this will be very interesting. First, the characteristic of people with preclinical Alzheimer's disease is that overall they don't deteriorate. 40% of, of people in their 70s without cognitive impairment have a positive amyloid scan and don't deteriorate beyond what you'd expect with them 
with aging. So the results of this trial are going to be very interesting. They're going to be interesting because of the long-term treatment and, and, it, and to be able to document that people actually were able to receive monthly infusions over time. And, it's, and there's a good chance, you know, there's a reasonable chance that the trial could be positive and show a small effect. If that were the case, one of the more interesting parts, aspects of solanezumab is, is that is an antibody that is not a plaque buster. It does not bind to fibrils or plaques. Rather, it binds to A-beta monomers, A-beta-40 yeah. peptides, A-beta-42 length peptides in the periphery. And in that way, alters or draws out monomers from, from, the, from the CNS to a sync effect. Now, in earlier studies, in mild AD, trials were statistically not significant. They did not reach their endpoints. But the numbers of the outcomes were just on the edge of significance. And the outcomes showed effects, such as on the CDR, some of boxes, and on the 8S COG that were of the same order of magnitude, essentially the same as what we see with glucanumab and aducanumab. So it will be particularly interesting if the results of this long-term, more of a prevention study should turn out to be positive. It would imply that, again, we may not have our target quite in hand, but that altering amyloid in this way rather than directly busting plaques or altering mm-hmm. oligomers could be particularly effective. So that's perhaps the most interesting and, and important event that's going to occur in the next few months. Boy, that is a fascinating strategy. It's like you're getting rid of the building blocks here for the oligomers and the plaques. And also, as you, so it's me- mechanistically a little different, but also, as you mentioned, the duration, the sheer length of time here. So, boy, fingers crossed on that one. That's certainly interesting. You know, you and I are clinical trialists predominantly, and I could certainly talk about the details of the clinical trials all day, but a lot of our audience is going to be clinicians. And so if you don't mind, Lon, maybe we can shift over a little bit. We've talked a little bit about the clinical stages of Alzheimer's, but what is important here is not only the clinical presentation, but th- there's been some real advances in the biomarkers. And Maybe you could help us walk through some of the biomarkers and, and how and when they may be used. And we could talk about imaging and also uh, plasma, CSF, wherever you'd like to go with that. Certainly. So we can divide the use of, of biomarkers related to dementia diagnoses and Alzheimer diagnoses into two or three categories. One is the use of biomarkers as diagnostic aids or as diagnostic tests to qualify obviously a person with for a diagnosis. Another is the use of biomarkers to track the course and extent of pathology of an illness or of Alzheimer's disease. And the third is the use of biomarkers as a replacement outcome for clinical outcomes, mm-hmm. as a surrogate outcome instead of a clinical outcome. And right. of course, this is Alzheimer's disease, and the use of biomarkers in any of these three areas are one at the same time, illuminating and controversial. Right. Well, certainly the latter that you mentioned is how the latest two antibodies were approved, essentially. Yes. So in discussing their uses as diagnostic aids or diagnostic tests, the main focus should be now on using amyloid PET scanning to essentially increase the likelihood or confirm the presence of plaques and the likelihood of of tangles. So I had mentioned earlier how we use positive amyloid PET scan or a positive Alzheimer's CSF profile to confirm or to support a diagnosis of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Essentially, we're saying this is Alzheimer's disease because of the positive A-beta PET and possibly because of a positive tau, and cognitive impairment is optional. Well, the same is holding for 
mild cognitive impairment or prodromal Alzheimer's disease or for mild Alzheimer's disease. After identifying a syndrome of mild cognitive impairment where the memory impairment is is great as it is in dementia, but functional activities are not very much affected, we'll use an amyloid biomarker to increase the likelihood that this is Alzheimer's disease rather than another process. Similarly with dementia, with mild dementia. The biomarker, an A-beta biomarker enhancement is becoming used more often to help at least make that, in effect, a neuropathological diagnosis. We've added to that in terms of the theme of biomarkers as diagnostic aids with blood biomarkers. So that (laughs) measuring A-beta 42 and 40, A-beta 40 in blood, and assaying particular isotopes of phosphatel 181, phosphatel 217 will soon become relatively commonplace as a diagnostic aid to try to increase probability, increase likelihood that when you diagnose somebody clinically as Alzheimer's disease, you have that um, biomarker support. The limitations of that, though, are that they still are not as sensitive and specific as we'd like, but it is a substantial improvement and it can be particularly helpful in clinical course. Uh, The next part of the biomarker story is looking at the magnitudes of change of a variety of biomarkers, many not specific for Alzheimer's disease. So on the one level, amyloid PET scans are not particularly good at tracking the progression of illness. By the time an amyloid PET scan is positive, it tends to stay positive and the tracer signal doesn't particularly increase. And similarly in blood, A-beta 42 to A-beta 40 ratios won't necessarily continue to decline in a way that you can correlate it with course. However, the phosphatal blood tests and then emerging blood tests that may measure a GFAP or a glial, a microglial, an astrocytic fibrillary protein and the marker of inflammation may be particularly good at tracking clinical course along with the nonspecific neurofibrillary light chain and neurogranin, a protein that, that can correlate with synapses and synaptic density. Over the near future, blood-based biomarkers are going to be used to a greater extent clinically. Now, the last part of biomarkers comes back to drug development and Mm -hmm. regulation, and that is Mm -hmm. the question, can we use a biomarker as a substitute for clinical effect? Since it's so hard to see a clinical effect, and it's so relatively easy to see how these medications, these treatments affect biomarkers, can we use an antibody's effect on reducing plaques, busting plaques, decreasing tracer signal as a substitute for clinical change? And Mm -hmm. many of my colleagues and the FDA believe that it can be used pending some cognitive confirmation. So the basis Mm -hmm. for approving aducanumab was Mm -hmm. in the FDA seeing exposure response correlations of exposure to aducanumab decreases in the biomarker correlating to a small degree with cognition within the treatment group. These correlations, though, were only about 0.1, 0.15, but it was good enough for FDA to say, we think that the biomarker is indicating the potential for clinical benefit, and that's why we can approve under accelerated approval. Much more mm-hmm. work would need to be done to, to see just what the reliability of that is, because here we're really just defining a pharmacodynamic effect. Antibodies against plaques do what they're supposed to do. So mm-hmm. uh, a- again, we're still uncertain about whether we can use changes in pathologic proteins as, as substitutes for clinical change. Right. Now, the newer one, lecanemab, also went through that accelerated pathway, but the difference is they did show a little bit of a significant 
clinical benefit in preventing deterioration. And so they're actually going to also apply for the more traditional approval. Is that correct? Correct. The accelerated approval was based on data obtained from their phase two study and from their open label follow-up in their phase two studies. It was based on, for instance, these kinds of correlations between Mm -hmm. exposure and the response within group. Now, of course, when the FDA was evaluating this for accelerated approval and comparing it to what they saw with aducanumab, They knew the top line results of a phase three trial. So that no doubt affected or made them more confident in the accelerated approval. But the phase three trial still needs to be the, still needs to be carefully reviewed by FDA, which they're doing now before they can give the aducanumab regular approval. It obviously appears most likely that aducanumab, excuse me, Licanimus Lic- Lic- will, get, yes. will get regulatory approval because the, there's no reason to doubt the conduct of and the outcomes of the of the trial reported in the New England Journal. That's what the FDA's mission is. Nevertheless, they need to carefully review the trial. If and as expected, Lacanumab gets regular approval, then it's gone a long way towards being eligible for reimbursement right. from CMS in, in one form or another because it's gone, it will have gone a long way to achieving necessary and reasonableness criteria for reimbursement. Yeah, and of course, it's going to make it more widely available because reimbursement is everything for these very expensive drugs. You know, Steve, you and I have been talking in the last episode, of course, about this almost worshiping at the altar of the amyloid theory. What do you think here about what Lon's saying? Well, I think it's going to end up being a little bit of a cost benefit as well as a risk benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. So if you have to stand on your head and whistle Dixie in order to see some clinical improvement over long periods of time, is that worth $26,000 per patient per month or three or $400,000 a year? So, you know, I guess that's going to be part of the problem. The other antibodies that are used for, you know, ulcerative colitis or rheumatoid arthritis and so forth are similarly expensive, maybe not quite as much, but they have a bigger effect size in the disease state. So I think that that's going to be part of the question is to, you know, how early do you treat, of course, like Lon so elegantly stated, but then if you're treating early, you're talking about 10 years of treatment every month. You're talking right. about several million dollars per patient times how many patients? Six, eight, ten million patients. It could cost a trillion dollars to use an antibody. So mm-hmm. that's going to be the question. Well, I think also what Lon said is we don't know for sure that you're going to have to keep treating with the same frequency if you're treating over that length of time. I mean, is it possible that you've altered the process to some degree, or maybe once you have, you know, we have many examples in psychiatry where you treat acutely more intensively, and then you can back off for maintenance, if you will. Lon, what do you think about that? Yeah. So this is pretty important. You know, at least when I was in medical school, we talked about passive vaccination and active vaccination. And so giving monoclonal antibodies or IgG was called passive vaccination. So maybe that kind of an approach very much earlier can work. And of course, this also speaks to the idea of using and developing active vaccines against the same targets so that you can let effectively your B cells work over many years to create antibodies against the amyloid that's slowly being produced. However, fast forward, and that is the next important event in the development of antibodies for Alzheimer's disease will occur probably around May or so when Eli Lilly reports the results of denanumab. And denanumab is a particularly potent and focused plaque buster because it attacks mainly the pyroglutamated end terminal of a beta. But I'm bringing this up because Eli Lilly has a vision on the use of antibodies. And the way denanumab is being used in the clinical trials is in a individualized and titrated way. And that is that the antibody is given to patients or placebo in the clinical trial. 
and their amyloid PET scans are monitored at six and 12 months. What Lily is looking for is the tracer retention plaques to go down to below about 25 centiloids, to go down to the what's considered a normal level of plaques. And if that occurs at six months, the protocol is to stop the antibody or to decrease the antibody dose by half. Similarly, Mm -hmm. if it should occur then at 12 months, the same procedure occurs. And then at 18 months. So the idea is we treat to effect. We use the antibody to treat to plaques going into the normal range, and then we stop. Part of that is informed by the idea that when you do reduce plaques to normal, it takes a very, very long time for plaques to reaccumulate if they actually do. So Lily's concept of the treatment is essentially denanumab's a plaque buster, get plaques to normal, and stop. Maybe in the future, maybe you'd give a few more doses as boosters, as it were. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if this is a positive study and if this actually got FDA approval, the course definitely is not indefinite. The course for denanumab is limited. You treat for a limited amount of time, monitor and stop. So then we don't have the concept of having to come into an infusion center every two weeks for the rest of your life to receive antibodies. Just don't have that level of uncertainty. Although in fairness, subcutaneous preparations are, of lecanemab are being developed, which should allow usage at, at home and self-administration. Yeah, both of which strategies here would be much more cost effective or less costly. Uh, perhaps a little more yeah. palatable to, to one, the public. Yeah. If I may just might make one correction, and think, Steve, you might have misspoke. The estimated cost of glucanumab itself over the course of a year is $26,500 wholesale for an, a person of average size. And it'll be more or less depending on, on your size. The rest of the cost, though, for using the Canamab will involve the cost of going to infusion centers, medical visits, MRIs to surveil for adverse events, four or five in, in a year, the initial PET scan that most of us would recommend. So then all of this adds up substantially to close to $100,000 a year that whether it's, if it's not covered by, by Medicare then it's $100,000 or so out of pocket. If it is covered by Medicare, then it might be $20,000 out of pocket, which is still very substantial, certainly for a retired California teacher. So that's per year. Yeah, I guess the question still is, you know, is justifying the Mm cost-benefit ratio, if you will. And, you know, at this point, again, that benefit is not robust and takes a lot of time to see. And the question is, you're right, is it worth it to the individual? Is it worth it to to society, to the family? So with the individual, I think fundamentally, it's the hope or expectation that the therapeutic effect might continue for an indefinite (laughs) amount of time and that there may indeed be disease modification such that many people are better off several years from when they started medication than people who did not start medication. And that's just really tough. It's going to be a tough call for patients, families, physicians, and everyone. There there could be something there and Mm -hmm. some people may benefit, but it would be a small proportion of, of people. Right. And of course, you know, if you think about the cost offset, you know, as far as decreasing the need for institutionalization, supportive care, and so on. Again, those costs aren't going to be realized till pretty far down the road either. So then that's another thing to think about. Correct. I'm curious. So, you know, Lon, talking to you is so fascinating. You understand this at such a level of granular detail that I hadn't fully appreciated all the different ways of slicing the amyloid story and of attacking amyloid, if you will. And it sounds like there are a lot of sophisticated ways of doing this that are coming. And um, 
And so we for still for some time, we're still going to be playing the amyloid game, if you will. I'm curious what your thoughts are about the tau interventions that are also being looked at. Well, this is just emerging. The rationale, of course, is that Alzheimer's disease and neurodegeneration is not just an amyloidosis. And to, to mm-hmm. some degree, we have trouble describing how an amyloidosis ultimately leads to neurodegeneration. Alzheimer's disease is also a talopathy and arguably is the most common talopathy. With the amyloidosis, there is substantial tau spread and there is neurodegeneration. What we see pathologically are not just amyloid plaques, but tangles, but neurofibrillary tangles, essentially phosphatal tangles. So it makes sense that focusing on abnormal tau is a rational therapeutic goal. And so quite obviously, since the, at least the manufacturing success of of A-beta antibodies, we have a range of tau antibodies, usually IgG-backed antibodies that will bind to different forms of tau, both extracellular and intracellular. And these have been advanced into phase two, focused not just on Alzheimer's disease, but also on some of the talopathies like progressive supranuclear palsy or frontotemporal dementia. In Alzheimer's disease, so far in phase two studies, this approach has not been successful in the sense of clearly showing clinical benefit. One or two phase two studies have shown statistically significant differences in outcomes, often not the primary outcome, but this is a therapeutic approach in evolution. And as Mm -hmm. Steve mentioned earlier, or maybe you did, the combination treatments are, of course, obvious. Why not name it amyloid and tau? So in fact, in dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, which occurs early on and in which one gene, typically one presenil and one gene mutation, is purely causative of the illness, there are ongoing studies that are designed such that, for example, the canamab is given to everyone who is at risk or who will soon develop dementia, dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. And then the tau, the experimental tau antibody is randomized on top of that. The rationale being that this would maximize any effect that the tau antibody would have. So this is evolving. This is part of the search for therapeutics. Yeah, sounds like a very sophisticated approach. And again, it'd be nice if we had different, whether it's a clinical syndrome or biomarkers to understand how to employ these strategies. It's making me think of the analogy of schizophrenia, where I don't, this is obviously a heterogeneous illness. It's a complicated neuropathologic process. There's probably many different ways to catch Alzheimer's, if you will. And so we need different treatment modalities and we need to understand how and when to employ them. And that leads me to think about, okay, we have certain tools now. The question is for clinicians, let's say this lecanemab becomes more widely available. At what point would you think of using this? At what stage, for instance, would you begin using this treatment? Short answer is at the stages for which it is approved. (laughs) And that that would be for prodromal Alzheimer's disease, which is MCI Mm -hmm. due to Alzheimer's disease, or early Alzheimer's disease in people who are biomarker positive. The more Mm -hmm. complex answer to the staging has to do with the extent to which the patient, a family, and the medical system are all on board. To use a metaphor or kind of an aphorism, it takes a village to prescribe an antibody. We need a system. We need infusion centers. We need management of the patient from dose to dose to ensure that he or she is getting the dose to ensure that it's been safe, to monitor for edema and hemorrhage, and then to take action. So it's not just writing a script and giving it to the patient and saying, go down to the infusion center at at XYZ Mm -hmm. hospital and they'll do it. it. It takes much more consideration. So at what level of severity? 
Well, the best we can do now is treat in the range for which the medication had been tested and for which there's evidence of a positive effect. Having said that, though, a dilemma that we'll always have is what about someone who is a little bit more severe, who has mild Alzheimer's disease, but also has a mini mental state of let's say, 18, which is out of the range of the clinical trials. Do we withhold treatment? Does CMS not cover that? What about people who don't quite have the memory impairment needed for a mild cognitive impairment diagnosis? And the memory impairment for MCI is actually at the same level, the memory impairment threshold is at the same level as we'd use for Alzheimer's disease, dementia. It's considerable, measurable memory impairment. So what about people who are more preclinical, who have memory complaints, Mm -hmm. whose memory may have declined over time, but not down to that level, and who have a positive amyloid biomarker, positive amyloid PET scan, and who want medication and can afford the medication, do we withhold? These are the dilemmas and challenges of of everyday practice. Well, I suppose if someone can afford it, they may go for it. But as you said, it's not that simple. There's a whole lot else that has to go into this. And, you know, monitoring for those arias that you mentioned, the hemorrhaging and the edema, which most of the time are asymptomatic, but certainly can be quite symptomatic. I mean, that's another wrinkle here that we're not used to doing, to monitoring. You know, listening to this, I'm wondering, Lon, is it possible that the amyloid cascade hypothesis, whatever it is, is still alive in a sense, but that by the time you get plaques, and you have all this, you know, really good imaging and ways to diagnose with some certainty, the nerves are dead. And that what we really want to do is when the, they're screaming bloody murder, but still salvageable, maybe this is well long before plaques are formed, and that whatever's going on is in the very early stages of that. And if we could identify that, which doesn't look like we have really good ways to know, you know, maybe people start getting that in their 40s. Maybe they start, you know, before they have symptoms, but that the cascade is brewing and your nerves are in distress. They're not dead yet and they're salvageable. So maybe that's what we need is to be able to identify that earlier. What do you think of that? Oh, I totally agree. I think that's also where the fundamental emphasis and optimism should be placed. Plaques are trailing indicators. Plaques are reactions Mm -hmm. to injury. Plenty of people die cognitively intact with a head full of amyloid plaques Mm -hmm. and actually don't have that much neuronal loss either. So Mm -hmm. you can envision that there are the people who have plaques and inflammation and progressive neuronal loss or synaptic loss, and that there are other people who have plaques and no inflammation and no progression because this is a manifestation of the brain doing its job of us reacting to injury. So you flip it around and you might say plaques are good in a sense. Plaques are the reaction to injury, the brain doing its job, sometimes not successfully. And so the target then is the neuronal degeneration. And just removing plaques may be a little bit akin to mowing the lawn or to mowing the lawn in a cemetery. And we should be looking at something else. And so then just to be really careful about this, the antibodies don't just attack plaques. The antibodies, the ones that are that, that are proof so far, also bind to oligomers. And it's quite possible that some of these small amyloid complexes, amyloid monomer complexes of 2, 16, 24, 12, 200 monomers could be the neurotoxic elements. They exist in very, very, very low concentrations, femtomolar concentrations, but they can be the bad actors that are interacting with synapses and causing inflammation, death, and destruction. So there again, the antibodies that we're giving and we're measuring plaque reduction as though that is the index of effect could be working to some extent and in effect, yeah, in some extent, some limited extent on reducing oligomers. And so that could be 
why there's such a small effect and why that effect could possibly be greater over a longer period of time in altering a disease deteriorating trajectory. So there's a lot here and we, we keep looking for the, you know, for the definitive treatment. I think it's going to take a while to work this out. Well, this graveyard analogy is fascinating. Steve, you've talked about the analogy of removing tombstones and not changing the death, if you will, too. You know, Lon, I've reviewed a number of protocols recently, and I'm sure you're working with a number of biotechs and other companies that have some of these novel approaches, particularly around the area of inflammation and the inflammatory process and what's causing it and how is it running amok. Anything there that's particularly interesting to you? The entire theory is interesting. So, an idea here is that by activating microglia in the right way, that the microglia can better undertake its housekeeping function and work to be effectively anti-inflammatory, neuroprotective. So then using either antibodies or small molecules to appropriately do this is yet another therapeutic approach. One of the rationales for how an anti-amyloid antibody works is that it ultimately is seen to reduce tau, and it does that by the antibody forming a complex with a beta, and that serving, and that then being opsonized, being essentially stimulating microglia to phagocytose it and to then ingest proteolytically, dissolve it and get rid of it, but also activates that microglia to attack tau. So what you see reliably with, with, the, with the amyloid antibodies in higher doses is you see a reduction in tau. It's almost as though the marker for an effective anti-amyloid antibody might be better the reduction in phosphatal <laughs> mm -hmm. than yes. in plaques. And that yeah. directly relates to your question about what about sure. targeting inflammation sure. and targeting plaques? And the answer is yes, and it's being worked on. Well, yeah, it's targeting them in the right way, if you will. It's getting them to activate against what you want and not more indiscriminately causing neuronal death. I want to switch quickly to, I'm very fascinated by repurposing drugs, Lon. And there are trials underway right now with some of the GLP-1 agonists, particularly semaglutide, which is used yep. or approved currently for diabetes, if you will, but they've been found to be very neuroprotective. What do you think is the possibility there? It's there. The, po <laughs> okay. the possibility. Well, there's a, the there's possibility abundant clinical evidence anyway. Yeah. Is there, there's substantial evidence. And aside from that, medications that improve metabolism or that mm -hmm. alter essentially intracellular metabolism, mm -hmm. think of it as altering the Krebs cycle, tend to have salutary effects across conditions. Now, what's going on with the GLP-1s is various smaller studies have been done with questionable effect in Alzheimer's disease, but there's some effect. These are potent medications, but Novo Nordis took a leap and they just decided that they would do two very large phase three studies involving well over 2,000 patients in each. One is slightly different from the other in that it allows more vascular pathology. And in a sense, they're going to have done with this. If you're doing studies in mild AD, prodromal mild AD, and they are large enough, we should be able to get a signal that you can value either mm -hmm. no signal or trivial signal or mm -hmm. one that it says there's something more here and uh, and we should uh, we should look at this more carefully but given that that good ones and that related drugs that are quote unquote metabolic enhancers mm -hmm. may be helpful in a variety of conditions sure this could be shown to be useful so as so much in pharmacology, it comes down just through the study. It's, yes. it's right. largely an empirical science, mm -hmm. and we do the experiment. Well, there's lots of theories, of course, and you're 100% right. There's been many good theories that haven't panned out. One final thing, I'm just curious, you mentioned vaccines earlier, and yet the vaccine trials that I'm aware of have been a little disappointing. 
Is there still interest in vaccines? And if so, what kind of interest? What kind of vaccines? Well, there's still substantial interest in vaccines against A beta, vaccines against different species of tau. The limitation of enthusiasm is as much commercial as anything else. The implication behind an anti A beta vaccine is is that it needs to be raised against the N terminal of A beta. It needs to be particularly sensitive and specific, and it needs to cause titers to be raised high enough. Many vaccines in development don't quite do that. Even if you can raise the level high enough, it's not going to compete with the massive amounts of antibody that you can give intravenously. So Mm -hmm. a theory then of vaccine's effects has to be that they need to be given as a preventative. They would have their best shot if they were given in midlife. I'm not sure whether that's 30s, 40s, 50s, and given regularly so that B cells have a regular ability to respond to the uh, misprocessing of, let's say, amyloid uh, precursor protein. Mm -hmm. So those are hard studies to do. The studies that have been done with vaccines have been in mild to moderate patients who are quite advanced. In others, Mm -hmm. in phase one and phase two also, where titers haven't been raised to a level that's considered high enough. So a number have been retired or discontinued, and some are being developed. Obviously, the idea of a vaccine as a disease modifier would really fully supplant the use of twice-weekly monoclonal antibodies, although Mm -hmm. still you might need to take two, three, four boosters. Right. A year, which could be a burden. Oh, I think it's a lot more attractive in a lot of ways, obviously, potentially. Well, Lon, I can't believe how fast this time has gone by. It's just been fascinating speaking with you. I really appreciate your time and your expertise. I'm sure this has been illuminating for the audience and spurred some thoughts and maybe some optimism. You know, we've really looked at all the wrinkles of the amyloid theory and going down this pathway. And Steve, maybe it's not quite dead, but... Maybe we need to refine our thinking a little bit about how to target this amyloid system. And it sounds like, especially earlier, and we're just not there yet to predict, you know, who earlier needs these interventions. Where are we at in your mind, Steve, with the amyloid theory? Well, I learned something again from Lon every time I hear him talk or read one of his articles. It's very elegant yes, and I eloquent. I think that what it tells me is that we're trying to shut the barn door after the cows are out. We're doing, and that's an <laughs> yeah. old-fashioned farm saying from the Midwest. Yeah. So what we have to do is get to this, keep the cows in the barn, shut the door while they're still in there. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that maybe while the nerves are still angry, salvageable, and p- picked off, that's when we need treatment, not when they're already dead and you have all these monuments and tombstones around. So is there something about the precipitant of the very earliest of the of the ultimately bad outcome that we can target by certain of the antibodies. Is there also something we can do with the nerve's reaction to it that could in itself be destructive, just like it is in so many other diseases? It often exactly. is the pathological reaction that gets quelled that actually stops it. And then finally, one thing right. we didn't really talk about, but that is kind of in my mind because I'm so interested in these new onset rapid acting antidepressants is maybe there's some things we can do to spur neuroprotective or actually better than that, Mm -hmm. plastic changes, neuroplastic Mm -hmm. changes. So, you know, if you stop the early process, you stop the reaction to it and you have some sort of neuroplastic kinds of things to save synapses, that's where the hope might be. And I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, we may be operating too late in the illness this is what, right. what we're saying or to in the process. And we're targeting things that, you know, the nerves are already dead. So I think that's very helpful to help me reorient to that because I've been kind of down myself on the amyloid mm-hmm. hypothesis for treatment is, you know, that part of it that the has said. But maybe I it's agree. just or we're learning to, we have to go earlier. But good work, Alon. Thank you for saying things that's, and stimulating yeah. and provoking thought. Well, I think we can clearly say, Steve, that while Lon may not be a disease modifier, he is a thought modifier, and he modified my thinking substantially. 
So, Lon, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. You know, I'd like to extend an invitation to have you back another time. There's so many other things I think we could talk about that we didn't explore. Okay. Well, well, thank you. I look forward to that. And uh, I'm glad some of this is interesting. Since I live it, I'm used to it and I'm <laughs> not always sure whether others are as interested as, as I am. I guarantee you that they will be. And I want to thank our audience and remind you that uh, there are many other podcasts in this series. Please come to the NAI website, neiglobal.com or wherever your podcasts are obtained and look for NEI Psychopharmacology or you can search the Psychopharmacology. Thanks so much for your time and please stay with us and tune in again. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. 